All Inclusive, a podcast on inclusion, innovation, and social justice with Jay Ruderman. Hi, I'm Jay Ruderman, and this is All Inclusive, a podcast focused on inclusion, innovation, and social justice. Marishka Hargitay is best known for playing Olivia Benson on Law & Order SVU. For the past 23 seasons, she has dealt with topics on sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse in the United States. She's also received thousands of emails from survivors sharing their stories of abuse after watching the show. In response, she created the Joyful Heart Foundation in 2004. Their mission is to transform society's response to sexual assault, domestic violence, and child abuse, support survivors healing, and end the violence together. Today, I'm speaking with Joyful Heart's Director of Policy and Advocacy, Ilsa Connect. She has spent 20 years invested in victim advocacy and is a nationally recognized expert on the rape kit backlog. She leads the foundation's End the Backlog campaign, which is at the forefront of identifying untested rape kits across the country. Previously, she was at the National Center for Victims of Crime, where she created the DNA Resource Center and led efforts to reform policies and practices related to testing rape kits. Ilsa, welcome to All Inclusive. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really grateful to be here. Thank you. So, yeah, so walk us through what happens when someone has been sexually assaulted. What do they do? Do they go to the police? Do they show up at the hospital? Just in a general sense, what happens at that point? Uh, well, survivors have many options after a sexual assault. They will choose the path that's best for them. So only about a quarter will ever report the assault to law enforcement. And uh, three quarters of them, unfortunately, don't report to law enforcement and may never tell anyone. And those victims, though, sometimes do find other ways uh, to heal. The criminal justice system is not the only way for survivors to find um, a sense of justice or healing. The quarter that do decide to interact with the criminal justice process often will show up at a hospital. They may call the police. And so it Survivors who go to the hospital can choose to have a forensic examination done, medical forensic exam. That's to collect evidence and also to attend to other needs, you know, such as injuries and emotional needs dealing with trauma after the assault. And those survivors in all states have another set of options at that point. And they can decide either to have the evidence collected and go through an interview with law enforcement and and basically enter the criminal justice system process, or they can have the evidence collected and then held for a certain period of time while they make a decision whether or not the criminal justice system path is the right thing for them. So, you know, that may be that in two weeks or two days or five years, they they feel that it's the right time for them to interact with the justice system, um, which by the way, is not an easy system to go through as a rape survivor. And they may decide at that point to have their kit tested. So let's dig into this a little bit more. Someone shows up at the hospital. They've just been the victim of a horrendous crime. Is the doctor or nurse or whoever's attending, are they mandated to offer them a rape kit examination? That's actually different state by state. So some states have laws. Texas has one of them that says if a survivor shows up at your hospital, you have to give the option of having a forensic exam there, even if you don't have a trained examiner, or to transport them to a, a center that does have a trained examiner. And then there are quite a few other states that don't have any laws around this. Uh, so a survivor may show up at a hospital that has no one trained to collect this evidence in a compassionate or competent way. Uh, they may wait hours and hours and hours while they find somebody who might be able to do this exam or wants to do this exam. And it's a whole other process in in those scenarios. So I guess what you're saying, um, someone gets out of medical school and uh, they haven't necessarily received the training how to deal with a victim of sexual assault. They may have had some brief training on how to work with a sexual assault survivor and uh, mention of the fact that there are evidence collection that needs to be done, but that's very, very brief. Many doctors 
you know, have to open up the rape kit exam box and read the instructions, you know, while the survivor waits. So it's always better to have a trained examiner. You know, they're sexual assault nurse examiners or sexual assault forensic examiners that are trained not only to collect the evidence, they're trained to testify in court, and they're also trained to respond to the trauma that the victim is experiencing. That's sort of the model that we hope all victims have an option to access. And I assume that all states have a rape kit. Yes. It's available in every state that that even if the hospital itself where, where the victim shows up, they can be pointed to someplace in the state where this process can be done. That's correct. There are many kinds of rape kits. So some states have one kind of rape kit they use statewide, and they're just much more organized about the fact that there's one kit, you know, and everybody uses it. And then there are other states that have many, many different kinds of kits they use. You know, some are more updated than others. Okay. So without getting too graphic, I understand that it's a very invasive process that someone, you know, is a victim of a sexual assault. They come into a hospital. They say, I've just been assaulted. At some point, someone says, you have the opportunity to, to be examined. What does this process look like? It's a process that can take generally about four to six hours, but it could take even longer depending on the nature of the attack. I think what's really important to remember here is that what a survivor has just gone through is probably the most traumatic experience, most personally invasive experience they'll ever have in their lifetime. They go to a hospital, a stranger is going to ask them to undress and stand on a sheet so that fibers or any other kinds of hairs from the offender might be able to fall onto the sheet. They're going to photograph them. They're going to swab parts of their bodies based on the sort of story you know, of the assault that the survivor has given, uh, the recounting of the assault, which of course is also very traumatic. And then their body will be swabbed in those areas. Basically their body has become a crime scene. There's an internal exam as well for internal injuries and lots and lots of documentation. The process involves a lot of questions about personal experiences beyond this sexual assault about consensual partners in the last you know, so many days and things like that. So it is a very personally invasive procedure. It's uncomfortable, you know, really be re-traumatizing if it's not done in the right way. And I assume that not every survivor has an advocate there with them at this point. That's right. There are quite a few states that have laws that allow survivors to have an advocate present during a forensic exam. That's something that we, we also work on is just ensuring that survivors' rights legislation includes the fact that they are able to have somebody present during the examination, somebody there just for them. You know, when, when there is a trained medical examiner who is doing this examination, they are also trained to call the local rape crisis center, and that advocate will then come in. But if you're not, you know, having an, an exam done by a trained examiner, that person probably isn't going to call the local rape crisis center. But in many, many cases, survivors have a right to have someone present with them. And can you walk me through what happens with the rape kit after the exam? And I mean, I know we're going to get into this a little bit later, but why would it end up sitting on a shelf? Let me tell you what should happen. Okay. So what should happen is that the exam is completed. The hospital contacts the local law enforcement agency and law enforcement comes and picks up the kit very quickly. The kit is then booked into evidence, sent to whatever local lab or state lab is responsible for testing crime evidence for that jurisdiction. And then the lab handles that quickly. It's done expeditiously. It's tested. If a foreign DNA profile from a possible offender is found in the kit, it's entered into state, local, and um, the federal DNA databases to see if there's a match and to see if they can identify an offender. So that's what should happen. What often happens is that the hospital calls law enforcement and says, you know, we have this kit, please come pick it up. Um, sometimes they don't come pick it up. And we've seen places where there have been kits sitting at hospitals for years and decades. More often, law enforcement do pick up the kits, but they get stuck at the law enforcement agency. And the vast majority of kits end up on a shelf in a storage unit, and they sit there for, for years or decades. Unfortunately, all too common, and that's why we have the untested rape kit backlog of hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits um, is because law enforcement has not sent them forward for testing at the crime lab. Basically, they sit on shelves and are just 
locked behind closed door, completely neglected. Which is a tremendous um, injustice. You know, I used to be a prosecutor many decades ago, you know, before, you know, DNA was being used uh, to the extent that it's used today. You know, I know crimes of sexual assault can be very difficult to prosecute because it used to come down to one person's word against the other. But let's talk a little bit about the police Mm -hmm. and law enforcement. Okay. What is the education and is there any uniformity across law enforcement as to how to interact with victims of sexual assault and how seriously to take, you know, what they're bringing forward to the police? So you hit the nail on the head with the priority issue. In terms of training of law enforcement and how to handle sexual assault and to work with sexual assault survivors, there's a real lack of training and a lack of knowledge about trauma and how it impacts survivors and their memory, DNA and how important DNA and DNA databases are in solving sexual assault crimes, and and just in general, how to complete a competent and thorough investigation for a sexual assault case. So I know that here in New York City, I've looked at the training manuals, I've looked at the agenda for training. Folks who are not specialized or sex crimes detectives are getting maybe four hours of it. But those who are, are, you know, are getting more training, but the training has not kind of kept up with what we know about sexual assault and what we know about trauma and how it impacts victims. So for example, the neurobiology of trauma has become a field that is more and more widely known. What's been found is that trauma impacts a survivor's brain in a way that causes it to not encode the memories of every of the assault in in the same way that we would just encode a normal memory right walking down the street. It interferes with the hormones that flood the body during the assault and after interferes with the ability of the brain to create a very clear memory of what happened. And so when law enforcement is interviewing sexual assault survivors, they don't understand that sometimes the memories don't come out in a linear fashion. The time, place, date which is what law enforcement want to know, is not how survivors are, are remembering the assault. So when a survivor might say something to the effect of, you know, it was a blue car, and then maybe a couple hours later says it was green, that will come across to an untrained detective as lying, that the survivor is not telling the truth. And that's a misunderstanding about the way trauma impacts memory. When you talk to survivors after an assault, there will be lots of inconsistencies in their story, and that is completely normal. And so unfortunately, what we hear too often is, you know, victim wasn't telling the truth, uh, victim was lying, she couldn't even remember this, she couldn't remember that, case closed, you know, basically before investigation opened. So that is a a major, major problem with how law enforcement interacts with sexual assault survivors and um, understands trauma. So- is that the crux of the matter? Is that why many rape kits end up sitting on the shelf because the detective or law enforcement has decided there's not enough to go forward on this case? Yes, that's one piece of it. One of the larger kind of issues is that in many states, and this is changing, but even six years ago, most states did not have a law or policy about what's supposed to happen with this evidence. An individual detective at whatever department, is making a decision about what to do with rape kit evidence. And it came down to how much do they know about rape? How much do they know about DNA and DNA databases? Did they believe the survivor? Rape myths are all too prevalent. Victim blaming is all too prevalent still in our society. And if you have somebody who's untrained to look at this from a much more kind of almost clinical and informed, knowledgeable state, they're going to bring that bias and prejudice to this decision. And then you you put a woman of color, you put somebody who may be living on the margins of society, a homeless person, or, uh, you know, what some police call known to the department, um, you know, somebody who's been in and out of, of drugs, and other, you know, sort of trouble um, with law enforcement, immediately, the decision is not to, to believe that person, they're sized up based on all these other factors besides the a thorough, complete investigation. Right. So, you know, the law, the, not having any kind of policy that says, your bias doesn't matter here, right? We're going to send this kit for testing no matter what you think. Uh, because unfortunately, I guess we'll get into this later, 
there have been many, many horrific mistakes made when when detective makes their own decision, you know, based on their own prejudice about testing a kit. Right. And I remember from my time as a prosecutor, you know, every city and town has a different police department. Right. And they're all different. And even within departments, you have some detectives who are great at what they do and take their job very seriously. And you have some who don't. So this whole hodgepodge going uh, throughout the country, and I completely get what you're saying, that, that there's no uniformity. Right. And, you know, just throwing on top of that, the fact that in some places there aren't even sex crimes detectives. Right. Um, there are people who are not even trained specifically to deal with this. There are no sex crimes units or they're severely underfunded. So even, you know, when you have a unit where you have trained detectives, we still see really shoddy outcomes, unfortunately. So if in a perfect world, all of the backlog of uh, rape kits were tested, what would happen at that point? Would you have that many more convictions, that much more closure in terms of helping victims move on from their trauma? Absolutely. There are two pieces to this. One is obviously getting justice and answers for victims. And then they're also taking dangerous offenders off the streets. And what we have seen from communities like Detroit, like Cleveland, like Memphis, um, even smaller cities like Duluth, Minnesota, is that they have taken these old rape kits, some from the 80s and 90s, off the shelves and tested them. And they have found dangerous serial offenders who have been operating with impunity for decades. And not only do we see crimes that could have been solved had a rape kit been tested, we see preventable crimes. And that's, you know, the next horrifying level of of this work, because we can go back in time, we can look at these timelines, and we can see crimes that would have been prevented if somebody would have sent that rape kit for testing, if that victim had been believed, and the evidence had been processed. So if we took all the kits off the shelves right now across the country, these communities would be a much, much safer place. And just to give us an idea, how many rape kits are sitting on shelves across the United States? We don't really know the answer to that. And that is because most states, they're getting better at this, have have not tracked their rape kits. So just to give you an example of how unimportant and deprioritized this issue is that we would talk to law enforcement agencies that would say, we can't give you a number because we don't track those. Uh, I'd have to go back to some big notebook, you know, from whatever date and count them. So, you know, just this, the sheer fact that, that most law enforcement agencies are not paying attention about how many kits they have coming in or going out. You know, we, we estimate hundreds of thousands of untested rape kits right now. And we are actually in the middle of doing a national count because we have data on almost every state right now. But I would still say hundreds of thousands are still sitting out there on shelves waiting to be tested. Um, for example, we, we had an inventory in California that we were we helped with that legislation, and they counted more than 13,000. But a very large majority of the law enforcement agencies in the state did not send their numbers in. So we're just looking at even a state like California potentially having 20,000. The numbers just keep adding up, and we're making a dent in it, don't get me wrong, but they're still far too many out there. So let's talk about the medical examiner. The medical examiner has kits on their shelves. Why are they not allocating technicians to test them? Why are they, why are they sitting there? Well, generally, it's the state crime lab. It's um, not the medical examiner. In New York City, the medical examiner is the agency that does the exams. But state crime labs or local county crime labs are the agencies that generally are testing rape kits. I will say that once the kits get into lab jurisdiction or into their queue, most of the time they will be tested, unless there's some reason they can't be tested because they're not eligible for the database or some other reason. It's not as much the kits that are in the lab that we're as worried about. It's the kits that never make it to the lab. So there are kits that are just sitting in law enforcement storage, sometimes in a refrigerator somewhere. There was a case in North Carolina where there was a rape kit sitting in a refrigerator next to somebody's lunch, you know, and of course that's in it. you're not supposed to store kits like that, but you know, just they're, they're kind of all over the place, but it's really those kits that were deemed not important enough to even make it to the lab that is making up this backlog problem. So let's go back to talking about the victims. Um, Always. Yes. Do they know what happens to their rape kit after it's been done? Do they know it may be, 
sitting on a shelf and it hasn't been tested. And the other question I have is like, how does this impact the mental health of a victim if they know or if they don't know that this has not been tested? Yeah, this is such a crucial issue, Jay. Most survivors leave the hospital and never hear again about their rape kit. Many will never ask. Some will ask and they'll never get answers. I've talked to so many victims who've said, I just figured they were testing it. I mean, why would you collect evidence and not send it for testing? That's what victims believe is happening. Also, society believes that too. So um, one survivor said to me, you know, I blamed myself. Um, I thought maybe I wasn't a good enough witness, or maybe I didn't tell the nurse what I needed to tell her um, to get the right evidence, or, you know, all kinds of things. Of course, the victims will often go back to blame themselves. The ones that do hear about their kids um, tend to be better off in, on their healing journey. We um, actually did some research and um, in 2016 uh, with survivors that we asked them questions around, what would you like to know about your rape kit? Would you like to be notified about your case? The vast majority of them said they felt that the rape kit belonged to them. Their body was a crime scene and part of it was collected and put in this box. And that the information is, is central to their healing and their well-being, and that not having information and not having access to it is actually harmful to them. Um, so it was really clear to us that survivors want information, and that having information is really important to their healing journey. And I would imagine that some of them, like I, I read about a victim who became an advocate in Florida and actually helped you know, pass some legislation uh, in the Florida legislature to help remedy the situation. But I'm sure there are other victims who are just, you know, far too traumatized and want not to revisit this again because of the potential of being re-traumatized. Survivors will sometimes say, you know, that I just didn't want to think about it. I wanted to push it aside. I just wanted to kind of move on. But what they will also say then is that I never did and that it's impossible to move on, that they think about it all the time. You know, they wonder where their kid is or they wonder where the offender is. I've had so many survivors say, I felt this burden because this person was still on the streets and I knew how dangerous they were. And something I did or didn't do, they felt like maybe helped that person to escape justice. So survivors carry that on their shoulders. Many survivors report only because they want to stop this person from hurting someone else. So let me just ask you, um, what compelled Marishka Hargitay to start the Joyful Heart Foundation? As you may know, Marishka has been playing Detective Olivia Benson on Law and Order Special Victims Unit for more than two decades. And when she started playing that role and, and was preparing for the role, uh, she trained at a rape crisis center. She was reading everything she could. And the information that was in front of her was really opening her eyes to the statistics about this problem and the reality and the impact on survivors. And she says, I've got fan mail, but it wasn't the normal kind of fan mail. It was letters from survivors saying, I've never told anybody this, but uh, you know, this happened to me, disclosing their stories of abuse for the first time. And many were saying, you know, I wish I had a detective like you. I never got the compassion, you know, that that your character shows survivors on TV. And she just felt very compelled to do something about it. And so her answer to these survivors was to create the Joyful Heart Foundation in 2004 with the mission of helping survivors heal and reclaim joy in their lives. And today, our mission is to transform society's response to domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse to support survivors' healing and end this violence. One of the things that really um, struck her was the rape kit backlog. So that's something that um, we've been focused on for many years and is really a core of the work we're doing now. So I've heard Marishka say that she wants to bring joy back into the lives of, of victims again. Mm -hmm. What does this look like for the foundation? Well, the foundation originally was doing work on healing with survivors. Uh, we had survivor retreats that addressed the trauma that survivors were experiencing in a kind of holistic manner and looking at different sort of healing modalities um, in addition to traditional methods. You know, what other things could help survivors heal? And actually looking at the fact that research was showing that it wasn't that healthy for people to tell their story over and over again. We kind of already knew that because we were trying to ensure that 
law enforcement and prosecutors were working together. So survivors never had to tell their story a thousand times, but that was something that started becoming more kind of known in the, the victim services field. And so looking at how to address trauma in a different way with yoga and movement and experiencing nature. And so that was something that Joyful Heart worked on for many, many years. We had healing retreats with survivors. And then we did some research uh, with Georgetown University to look at how are these retreats working. And so that research shows that survivors were coming out of this kind of retreat better than they went in. Let me put it that way, and that they, they were definitely having good healing experiences. And then also we looked at those who are working with survivors and sort of the vicarious trauma that they experience could be therapists. It could be rape crisis centers, counselors. It could be the the nurses that we've spoken about. It could be law enforcement Um, and looking at their trauma and helping them uh, heal from that trauma. And we worked with law enforcement in different communities across the country and other stakeholders there to kind of teach them self-care, how to, you know, not kind of take in, and hold that trauma that they hear and they experience, you know, from their interaction with survivors. So that was a large part of what Joyful Heart was doing um, in the early days, all with carrying sort of Mariska's words of helping survivors reclaim joy in their lives. Well, I know that Mariska has really been an important advocate and has really done the important work that someone who has her celebrity, you know, we all expect, you know, would do. You have spent 20 years invested in, in victim advocacy. Can you tell us how you got involved in this work? Sure. Um, you know, without going into like my whole life story, um, I just kind of I have to credit my mother for kind of instilling in me this passion to make things better for other people. And I was working in a women's clinic and had a, a good friend working there. And she was abducted and murdered. Uh, by a serial offender. Um, this was in Toledo, Ohio. Um, her name was Samar L. Oak D. And I was the last person to be with her. And so I was very involved in, you know, the investigation and going to court and working with the prosecutors and having to testify. Um, I saw things about the system that I thought were very um, damaging to the victims. And I just thought, I you know, want to do something about this. And I ended up working at the National Center for Victims of Crime in DC for 16 years. I there is when I learned about the rape kit backlog. And I remember exactly where I was sitting. I was reading an article. And it was about a woman named Debbie Smith, um, who was the namesake of a federal law related to testing rape kits, a fantastic woman advocate. And I just felt like, oh my God, my head's like going to explode. What is going on here? How are these kits not being tested? This is absurd. And so that just became my my life's work and uh, worked on federal legislation and state legislation. Um, National Center for Victims of Crime. I created the DNA Resource Center there, looking at using DNA in all kinds of crime, uh, maximizing the potential of DNA in trafficking cases and burglary cases and all missing persons cases. But I was always really focused on the rape kit backlog. Um, and then it came to Joyful Heart uh, six years ago and really was able to hone in specifically on accountability for law enforcement and um, other parts of the system around making sure that rape kits are tested. Well, I have to give you a lot of credit. I spent several years in the domestic violence unit in the district attorney's office that I worked in on the North Shore of Massachusetts. And it is a grueling process and you see some success, but you often don't see success. And, you know, to spend, you know, 20 years dedicated to this is, is really God's work. So I give you all the credit for that. And you've had some tremendous success. Yes. I want to sort of switch to the Freedom of Information Act and how that may have been able to support victims' rights to access information about the rape kits. Can you talk about that? Well, the Joyful Heart Foundation has a project called the Accountability Project, and we have been using this tool across the country to shine a light on the number of untested kits. This is one of the tools we're using to try to get law enforcement to go into their evidence rooms and count their kits and be public about it. So um, we've issued more than 65 across the country, and we're in the middle of about 20 more. And as you know, so for at the agency level, we're 
sending these to law enforcement and sheriff's offices, sometimes prosecutors, sometimes labs, to try to find out what their numbers are. We do that on behalf of survivors of those communities. Survivors themselves can also use the FOIA process. Um, it's probably more effective if they try to, you know, do that with an agency that kind of helps represent them. But you know, it's it's sunshine laws. You know, it's it's like that's the sunshine's the best disinfectant, right? So using this tool that's available to us um, is something that we are relying heavily on. I will tell you, unfortunately, probably three quarters of the time, we don't get any responses or we get half responses or, you know, we're fighting back and forth for months and years with these agencies to get them to comply with the with the law. And is there advanced technology today that could sort of be more seamless in the way survivors can know what's going on about their the status of their kits? Yes, absolutely. When you order something on Amazon or even Grubhub, you can track your your food or your shoes right. everywhere it is from this warehouse to that warehouse to this stop. And now it's on the truck. And 10 years ago, those of us in the field were saying, well, you can certainly do that with a rape kit. This is existing technology. I mean, now we don't really think about it, but back then we're, you know, it was the kind of the beginning of Amazon and, and tracking everything. And so, you know, the sort of the rape kit tracking system was born out of this thought and labs were already using some tracking software within their lab to know, you know, where the kit is. This was bigger. This was a system or is a system that tracks it from the first collection site, you know, through to law enforcement, picking it up, law enforcement, getting it into their storage unit and it getting to the lab through the lab and then its final disposition. So there are 33 states and DC that have either have a tracking system or in the process of creating one, which is amazing. When I look back probably even six years ago, and there might've only been just a few states, it's actually really transforming the field moving forward. All rape kits with, will be accounted for in these tracking systems Actually, the only state right now that doesn't have a victim portal is California, but we have a bill on the governor's desk there to change that. But all of these systems besides California have a way for survivors to log in and look where their kid is. And they can do that whenever they want to at their convenience. They don't have to pick up the phone and talk to someone and tell them their whole story and they're looking for their kid. They can do it in the middle of the night. They can do it 200 times a day or they can do it once a month. And so it's something that we've been really pushing is to make sure that these tracking systems have a way for survivors to log on anonymously and privately and get that information that's so important to them. So it sounds like some progress is being made and hopefully, you know, the system will become a lot more efficient. I know this is done state by state. Is there a role for the federal government? Can the administration help move this process forward? Yes. And the federal government has been very supportive of the Rape kit reform work is happening across the country and, uh, you know, Joyful Heart and our partners are um, engaged in. The Sexual Assault Kit Initiative is a federal grant program that provides money to states and localities to count their kits. So just to do an inventory, and that can cost some money. If you haven't been testing your kits for decades and you have 10,000 of them, that's a little bit of a process, right, to get through, to count them. So to count their kits to finally get them off the shelves and and send them for testing and to also investigate and prosecute the cases that come out of testing these kits. These are cold cases. Those are more difficult, as you probably know, as a former prosecutor, Mm -hmm. those are going to be more difficult to investigate and to locate the victim and to locate the offender. So bunny for that, because also, again, just testing the kit, if you don't do anything with the information that comes out of that testing, it's pretty meaningless. It's really important to follow up with those cases and be aggressive about it. But then also to work with the survivors in those cases. It's really important to remember is that for some survivors, it's been 20 years or more mm-hmm. or than they've ever had any contact with law enforcement about this case. So that contact can be very triggering and re-victimizing for them if not done in the right way. Sure. So the Sexual Assault Kid Initiative Program is much more kind of a holistic program that addresses the testing, prosecution, investigation, and, and victim engagement. So that's a, a the federal government is is investing in that every year around forty five million. The Biden administration has asked for that to be doubled, which is fantastic. We'd also like to see them support more or do some kind of work around pressing states to adopt 
our six pillar approach to rape kit reform. Um, we'd like to find some way to encourage states to get on board with the six pillar approach. And once they pass those six pillars, it really is a comprehensive reform of how the state handles their rape kits. Can you just briefly get into what the six pillars are? Yeah. So the first pillar is inventory. You obviously have to know how many rape kits you have before you can start dealing with them and where they are. Um, so for example, in New Mexico, um, Albuquerque had the vast majority of, of kits. So the resources are targeted in a different way if your kits are in mostly one city. Inventory, making a commitment to testing them, finding the resources to test them and having the tenacity to go through it. It took Detroit more than 10 years to test their 10,000 kits. Mandating the testing of all newly collected kits that are coming in within a certain time frame. Tracking, setting up a tracking system for rape kits. Granting victims the right to know the status of their kit in state law. And funding for all of these things. Of course, it all comes down in the, in the end to making sure that states are making the investment in these changes. You know, we look at it as public safety is the top priority of government, and this is uh, should be at the top of their list for their investment. So do these kits ever become stale? And do you deal with statute of limitations in different states where because the kits have not been tested for so long, the statute of limitations has run out and you can't prosecute the crimes anymore anyway? Right. So there are two issues here. One is sort of how long can you hold kits and how do you get DNA out of kits that are decades old? And the answer is yes. It's been actually amazing to look at kind of the hardiness and tenacity of DNA. When you look at Detroit, they had these 10,000 rape kits that were sitting in a warehouse with open windows. Half of the building was actually destroyed, like had literally been bulldozed and windows and birds flying around. You know, Detroit's cold, so it got very, very cold and it gets very, very hot in the summer. So they were taking rape kits off the shelf in Detroit and getting results from these rape kits. So that's pretty amazing. Some cases from the 70s have uh, gotten usable DNA from them. And so, you know, obviously they need to be stored correctly, but we have seen kind of amazing results from some of these cases that people thought, no, there's no, there's no way that, you know, usable DNA is going to come from these kits. The other side is the statute of limitations. And in some cases, it's 10 years, you know, it might be 15. It's different from state to state. Mm -hmm. And first of all, is every reason to test kits that are beyond the statute of limitations. That is our, our policy. That is what we suggest because one really kind of big theme has come out of this work is that survivors want answers. And justice means different things to different survivors. It might not necessarily be that they want the criminal out justice outcome of the offender going to prison. That, for many, is what they want. But they do find justice sometimes just through the process. Right. So if a case can't be prosecuted, an offender can't be brought to justice that way. Sometimes for survivors, it's just knowing that the system cared enough to test the kit and then to contact them and say, hey, we found your offender. It's this guy. Number one, it's who you thought it was. Or number two, here's a name for you. So you finally know. And also, many of them are already in prison Mm -hmm. because they're repeat offenders. And so for a survivor to know that person's in prison is really going to give them a sense of peace of mind. Many survivors say, I'm always looking over my shoulder and knowing they're in prison. It's just information that they really want to know. They also have opportunities sometimes to go and and give uh, victim impact statements in other cases related to that offender. So they may be able to go in to a parole hearing or to a sex offender hearing. So there's so many paths, ways that survivors can actually also get little kind of nuggets of healing through this process. And, you know, I've also seen prosecutors do kind of interesting things like, okay, there's no statute of limitations on this sort of theft or whatever, and, and be able to charge that person with stealing $20 but not be able to charge them for the rape. Right. You know, so it's it's really important for those kits to be tested and uh, one last point is that, you know, again, because many of these offenders are serial offenders, those kits may connect to other kits and then you can see, oh, this person this is one more case that is on this person's rap sheet basically. So which states have done the best job at working through their backlog and which states still have a lot of work to do to to get through the backlog of rape kits? Well, so we have more than 10 states that have adopted all the six pillars. And they're doing pretty well. But I will say 
for example, Texas is one of them <laughs> that has all the six pillars on paper, but has had you know some trouble with the implementation of the laws. That's kind of where we're looking now. A lot of our work is looking at how are these laws being implemented and trying to hold the stakeholders accountable for that. So I would say one state that has done really well is Kentucky. Um, they were very early in the reform process. They passed all the six pillars very early. They've got a wonderful state lab and the attorney general and the governor over t- periods have just been very involved in trying to um, make changes. We're seeing some good things happen in Missouri. Um, you know, Michigan, Ohio has done really well. We're you know working in several states right now that, that haven't really done anything on paper. So like Rhode Island and Maine is one of them, Mississippi, a couple of states that we'd like to see uh, some reform take place this year. And then most of the states are kind of in between. You know, they have some things they're doing, some reform. They may have gotten federal grants, but they're not working legislatively. Uh, so it's kind of a patchwork quilt. So the Rubin Family Foundation is based in Boston, and I know that the Joyful Heart Foundation has done work in Massachusetts. How are we doing here in Massachusetts? Um, Massachusetts, we've been you know through a, an interesting journey with Massachusetts. I will say, in the end, the sort of forecast is is good. We were involved in a law in 2018, um, without getting into the nitty gritty, basically was uh, had a loophole um, written into it that we were kind of unaware of that was able to be kind of taken advantage of. And we found out recently through our Freedom of Information Act requests and some very diligent reporters that there are about 6,000 untested kits that need to be tested in the state. And we recently went through the budget process and got some language in the budget process to fix that. Um, with some amazing lawmakers along the way and advocates, of course. So I think it's Massachusetts is actually in a good place now. And I know that they have a 30 day testing turnaround time frame for their new kits. And I've been told by several parties that that is happening and that Massachusetts is outsourcing some of their new kits to a private lab so that they can keep within that 30 days. And that's fantastic news. So I'm hopeful that Massachusetts is is really coming you know around and is going to get into um, that kind of comprehensive reform state you know soon. Great. I hope we yeah. live up to our ideals here. It's been an interesting road. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Um, in 2019, Grey's Anatomy became the first series on network television to ever depict what goes on into a rape kit. And the next year, Netflix Unbelievable came out and told the story of the true story of a woman who was failed by the system when she was accused of lying about rape. Do you think that media and entertainment has a responsibility in sharing these types of stories? And it, does it help move the issue forward? Yes and yes. Um, we've seen it, I think, time and time again with Law & Order SVU, of course, being very groundbreaking in that arena. And I'm not just saying that because Mariska's my boss. <laughs> um, but I think the more that the general public can see how this crime impacts survivors and what they have to go through after an assault, especially if they want to report to police and have evidence collected, the trauma that they experience. I think it's it's sort of almost person by person, you know, just making sure that people are more open to understanding what happens with survivors. I think the media can have a really big impact on what the general public thinks about these issues and also anger them and inspire them to action. You may know that Mariska produced a documentary called I Am Evidence, which won an Emmy and was about the backlog and followed the story of four survivors and what happened to them in their lives after their kits were collected and not tested. And we have just seen such an outpouring of people being inspired and uh, even from advocates to legislators uh, after seeing the film take action. Um, And so I think that's our hope is always that media will inspire people to take action and not just legislative action. It means if somebody tells you they're a survivor, that you believe them, that individual moment is so important to survivors. Don't ever underestimate the impact you can make in that person's life by just saying, I believe you and how can I help you? And I hope that, you know, these TV shows and meet and movies will, will show people that that's sometimes all it takes to really help a survivor heal and find joy. 
Yeah, I was just going to mention um, the I Am Evidence, which appeared on HBO, and, and Mariska and, and the Joyful Heart uh, Foundation have, has done tremendous work, and you've been at the heart of that, to really correct a wrong that's been systematic in our country. Maybe you can leave us with a success story, a rape kit that was that was on the shelf for many years, but actually ended up in a prosecution. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, there are many, um, which I'm glad to say there are many. Um, I think I want to mention a woman named Gail Gardner, who was in Florida. She's a, a survivor who was sexually assaulted by a serial rapist and was not believed. And, you know, her rape kit sat on the shelf in Orlando police department for a long, long time. Um, and it was recently tested and, and connected her assault to uh, many, I think maybe more than 20 other victims. So her case is being uh, going through the system now, but what also has been amazing is to see Gail kind of uh, blossom. I didn't know her before this, but um, she's become an advocate um, we worked on legislation in Florida named Gail's Law, which created a rape kit tracking system. Every time they needed her in, in Tallahassee, she was up there. She was talking to the media, whatever she could do to get that passed. And I'm not saying every survivor should do this. It's not for everybody. But just seeing how the sort of change in how her case was handled and feeling like finally the system was kind of responding to her and taking her seriously, I think has been so healing for her. There are cases throughout this country. It used to be, I don't know, once a couple of months, I would get a, a story emailed to me or through you know, some kind of alert system about a case being solved. But now, especially I think with the Sexual Assault Kid Initiative grant program, it seems like almost every day I get a story about a case that was solved using the DNA database or other methods. But just how important it is to know that this is happening and and this rape kit testing is making a huge difference in the lives of survivors. There's a lot of progress going on across this country. And I think that, you know, it's something that we kind of knew would happen, but we didn't know it would happen at this level. We knew we could fix this, but we, I don't think we really realized, you know, how much it would change people's lives and even start changing the system. So it's been, um, I think Gail's story though is, um, just such an amazing story, and she's she's a firecracker. <laughs> she's she's ready to go and raring to go for the next legislative session now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, finally, for those listening who want to help end the backlog, what steps can they do? Well, first they can go to endthebacklog.org dot org and look at your state and see what pillars your state has worked on and what they've accomplished, and you can email your legislators and your governor and your attorney general and talk to the media and kind of make noise about what is is going on in your state. And we're certainly willing to help you. You can contact us uh, to kind of, you know, give you ideas and tips and tools on working with legislators, working with the media. And, you know, to start from the beginning, just find out, does your state know how many rape kits they have? And are they testing them? So, uh, you know, I think it's a combination of working with media, working with legislators, even from your city council. You could go to your city council. Let's say your state hasn't done much or has done a lot, but still locally, a lot of local work is overlooked as how important it is. And it really is important to find out, you know, you could have a state law that says mandating kits is, you know, is the policy. Your local police department might be ignoring it. Um, so start local and, and just find out from your local legislators, you know, what's the policy here? What is happening in my community? So helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I, one thing I want to just really quickly mention Sure. when we look at the cases that are being solved through testing these rape kits, communities are finding these um, serial offenders who are not just committing sexual assault. They're committing all kinds of crime. And you look at their background, you look at their, you know, even the rap sheets, they've been arrested over and over again for things like bur- burglary, carjacking, you know, nonviolent crimes. Many of them have domestic violence backgrounds, uh, child abuse. Um, you know, range the range, just the gamut. So these are offenders who are impacting society as a whole. And what we've also found 
coming out of Cleveland, the research that they did there, is that testing rape kits actually saves communities money. And so when they tested 4,000 kits and they looked then at the crimes that they were solving and the crimes that they were preventing and the impact on society and victims, they were saving out $8,000 per kit. Wow. So there's an investment on the front end to testing kits, but it will come back to you and it will save you money, but it will create safer communities. So not only is this about individual survivors and getting them justice and healing, this is about preventing the next potential victim and also just making sure that our societies are just and um, and a safe place to live. Such an important point. I mean, I, I remember my time as a prosecutor. Rarely did I prosecute someone who only had one thing on their rap sheet. Right. So um, right, such right. an important point and, yeah. and a great way to, to end our conversation. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. I learned so much. Oh, thank you so much. And, you know, I hope a lot of people, you know, will listen to this and will take action. So thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, Jay. Thank you. All Inclusive is a production of the Ruderman Family Foundation. Our key mission is the full inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of society. You can find All Inclusive on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. To view the show notes, transcripts, or to learn more, go to rudermanfoundation.org slash allinclusive. Have an idea for a podcast? Be sure to tweet at Jay Ruderman.